for having me here today. Before I get going, I always like to know my audience. So just by a show of hands, how many of you are currently law students at the University of Iowa? Wow. Now, my start in what has become the name, image, and likeness space began 20 years ago uh, when I was a student at Michigan Law School. Like many of you, I had the opportunity to write a student note for a journal. And the article I wrote was called Reevaluating Amateurism Standards in Men's College Basketball. The argument that I made in this student note was that when the 1,200 NCAA member colleges got together and they all reached an agreement with one another that not only were they not going to allow athletes to endorse products for money, but they wouldn't allow any competitor school to do it either. I argued that that was a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. And I argued that these restraints on college athletes endorsing products for those reasons were illegal. Well, it took a long period of time after I wrote this note. And to be fair, I was not the only person who took this position. But it took a long period of time after that until the system began to change where for the first time college athletes had the opportunity to endorse products for money. Uh, June 30th, 2021 was the date in which name, image, and likeness reform went into place. So believe it or not, we are just 18 months, just a year and a half into this new system. And already we have conferences at schools like Iowa Law School that invite people like me to talk about name, image, and likeness. You know, I don't want to say that we're making this into something more important than it is, because if I said that, I would be making myself less relevant. <laughs> I will say that I am amazed after ignoring these issues for so many years, we're finally beginning to recognize that college athlete rights are human rights in this country. And that took a very long time to get to that point. And even with that acknowledgement today, most of the conversations that we have on name, image, and likeness are frankly filled with inaccuracies. And even if we listen to the best sources on TV like ESPN or read a lot of what comes out of the newspaper about name, image, and likeness, a lot of it is not exactly correct. 
So with the honor of being the person that gets to kick off the name, image, and likeness seminars here at Iowa Law School, I'm going to spend about 40 minutes from the best that I can to give a perspective of name, image, and likeness reform the real way name, image, and likeness reform came to be, which is going to be a bit different from the NCAA story. Uh, a lot of the positives that have emanated out of name, image, and likeness reform, and some of the challenges that we will see going forward. And I'll speak for roughly 40 minutes. Uh, the last 20 minutes will be question and answer. Uh, you're free to ask me anything you want. I have no idea what you guys are going to ask me about. I was swarm. But I'm happy to address any questions related to name, image, and likeness, and perhaps even some things that are more relevant specifically on this campus at Iowa or anything else you'd like to ask me. But it's a pleasure to be here. Now, I usually do not speak with notes, and I'm not going to make a break from that, but I have a few numbers just on an index card here. Uh, I believe that the best way to begin discussing name, image, and likeness in college sports is to begin with a broad economic overview of the college sports industry. And because I know that many people at the NCAA will disagree with what I am going to say, the numbers that I'm going to use are going to come from a source that the NCAA cannot object to themselves. And I'm going to read these numbers directly because these are NCAA numbers. These are not numbers from people trying to load the deck in a specific direction. This is the numbers that the NCAA used. And I'll put away this card in just a moment. The rest of it I could do off the top of my head. In 2019, the NCAA put together a budget presentation. This is according to the NCAA themselves. They claim that the revenues from Division I college sports were $15.8 billion. Now, they then conceded that their own number of 15.8 was too high, and I agree with them because some of that amount actually came from student funding out of tuition dollars directly given to college sports. So we could reduce that number by about a third, and we have 10.2 billion dollars that is generated in revenue from NCAA college athletics, $10.2 billion. Now, amongst the $10.2 billion that's generated from non-student tuition fees towards education, an overwhelming share of this amount comes from 75 to 100 colleges. And within these 75 to 100 colleges, an overwhelming share of that amount comes from, we could say one or we could say three sports, with football being dominant, then men's basketball and women's basketball. There are colleges that are now bringing in over $200 million a year in revenue from their athletic department, led by the University of Texas and the University of Michigan. If you're curious where Iowa stands on this list, according to the Wall Street Journal, and I'm not sure if Iowa finished in the top 25 in football rankings this year, but according to the Wall Street Journal, Iowa finished number 18 in revenue coming from their football program. And this is not all their sports, just their football program, at just over $100 million in revenue from their football program this year. Now, if you add in men's and women's basketball, my guess is that number probably falls in that 115 to $125 million range. To put that into perspective for people, and do we have any NHL fans here? So a few of you like the National Hockey League. The Florida Panthers play in a suburb of Miami. They play an 81-game season, plus after the season, if they make it, they play in the playoffs. The Arizona Coyotes play in a suburb of Phoenix. They play an 81-game season. Contrast that with about the 12-game season that the Hawkeyes play. And make no mistake, Miami and Phoenix are major metropolitan areas. 
Iowa City, not so much. The Iowa Hawkeyes football team brought in more revenue last year in their 12-game season than the Florida Panthers or the Arizona Coyotes. Not by much. It was very, very close. We're talking about just over $100 million to just under $100 million. But for all intents and purposes, we could call the sport amateur or professional or anything else you want. Your Iowa Hawkeyes in the 12-game season in Little Iowa City brought in as much revenue, if not more, than the Florida Panthers and the Arizona Coyotes over an 81-game NHL season. Now, what happens to that revenue? If the colleges that made up the NCAA were for-profit for institutions, they would pay out their costs, and the remainder would go to shareholder value. And the shareholders would make a nice sum of money. Now, almost every college in the NCAA is a not-for-profit meaning that there are not shareholders that get to keep the money. So in the absence of shareholders, the money needs to go somewhere. Whether it be the $100 million each year that Iowa brings in, whether it be the close to $200 million that Texas brings in, whether it be close to the $25 or $30 million that Rutgers brings in, for all of these 75 to 100 schools, the money needs to go somewhere. So some of it might go back into education, some of it might go into other sports, and this is the message that the NCAA likes to tell us. But a lot of it goes to a very limited number of employees at these schools that, while not technically shareholders, walk away with above market salaries to reflect the fact that they have brought in this revenue. Now, to illustrate this point, um, in 42 out of 50 states, the highest paid state employee is either a football coach or basketball coach at a public university. There are currently three coaches in college football who have salaries of greater than $11 million per year. Nick Saban, Kirby, Kirby Smart, uh, and the guy from over at Clemson all over $11 million per year. There are only two NFL coaches who make more than $11 million per year. So in the schools that are making the most money, they're paying their coaches more than NFL coaches are being paid. You have assistant coaches who are making one, two, three million dollars a year. You have athletic trainers who are making $500,000, $750,000 a year just for working for the football team. Well, what about that other labor sauce? What about the college athletes that play in these games? Well, historically, the NCAA member schools have gotten together, and they've all agreed with one another to what they call the principle of amateurism. And historically, that rule meant that no member school could compensate the athletes uh, for what they provide on the field beyond the cost of an education. Now, in terms of what that means for college athletes, according to a study that was jointly commissioned by an association seeking to organize college athletes and Drexel University, 85 to 86% of college athletes currently live below the poverty line. And if we want to talk about the athletes who play football and men's basketball and women's basketball, not only are these athletes who are disproportionately living below the poverty line while making huge sums of revenue for their schools and coaches, but if we want to look in terms of socio-demographics, these athletes are very disproportionately African American. So we have a huge disproportion of African-American athletes that are bringing in huge sums of revenue for universities who, are not, who have not been allowed in any way to share in the revenue. And the money is funneled not even all back into education. 
but to having these coaches and athletic directors who make many millions of dollars per year in salary off the backs of this labor force. Now, Taylor Branch, who is a civil rights Pulitzer Prize winning author, had described this system as having the whip of a plantation. I am not going to take Taylor Branch's terms, but I will say at a minimum, this seems hugely problematic. And the NCAA, which is a trade association of colleges, had not for a long time done anything to change the system. In fact, even as colleges around the country become more outward in their speech about diversity and equity and inclusion, and more willing to discuss minimum fair wage that we need in society overall, well, when you put these college presidents in the room under the banner of the NCAA, they become more like the robber barons that they purport to oppose. So how did we get here? How did we end up with name, image, and likeness reform if when the 1,200 presidents or athletic directors of the NCAA sat in a room, they had no desire to change the system? Well, what I proposed 20 years ago, my law review note, was an antitrust challenge to challenge the system that was in place, arguing when the 1,200 schools came together and they all agreed not only were they not going to pay their athletes, but others couldn't do it either, I viewed that as a violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. I wanted that to be challenged under antitrust law, much as the limits on in-kind educational compensation were challenged under antitrust law in the Alston case, a case which a year and a half ago, um, the plaintiffs won and the NCAA lost 9-0, with a concurring opinion from Justice Kavanaugh telling the NCAA that, word for word, you are not above the law. But name, image, and likeness reform took root in a very different way. And again, the NCAA was not part of this conversation. Several years back, the California Rotary Club invited an economist to come speak who had done some work on college athletes' rights. His name was Andy Swartz. Amongst the many people who came to listen to Andy Schwartz speak about the economics of college sports was a senator, was someone who was thinking about running for state senate in California, Nancy Skinner. She lived in Berkeley and was considering making a run for the state senate. Andy Schwartz gave a speech about the economic inequities in college sports, and Nancy Skinner came up to talk to him at the end. And they began brainstorming about what could be done to improve the rights of college athletes. Now, Andy and Nancy came at this from a little bit of a different perspective, but they landed in the same place. Andy Schwartz had really looked at the concern for revenue generating athletes, primarily football and men's basketball, who didn't get the share in the revenue. Nancy Skinner was really thinking about a different group of athletes, and this is really interesting to me. Nancy Skinner picked up on the point that for female athletes, sometimes their greatest earning opportunity is in the college years. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the WNBA, which is getting a little bit better in women's soccer, don't pay huge salaries to the athletes. And if you think about sports like gymnastics or tennis or figure skating, uh, most the athletes are most marketable. The female athletes are maybe most marketable when they're in school. And she thought there was a systematic problem there. They had played around with trying to propose something to ensure college athlete pay, but they were not sure if society or even California's Congress would be on board. So Nancy Skinner and Andy Schwartz got together with a third person by the name of Ramogi Yuma, who had tried to organize college athletes and particularly college football players for a long period of time. 
And they proposed in the state of California the passing of a bill called the Fair Pay to Play Act. What the Fair Pay to Play Act attempted to do was it attempted to create an affirmative obligation that if you were a college in the state of California, you had to allow your athletes, if they chose, to endorse products for money. Now, none of this was about pay for play. None of this was about schools paying their athletes directly. None of it was about shifting all of the revenue that came into universities to the athletes. It was simply they would not be allowed to take steps to prevent athletes from endorsing products. The NCAA in classic NCAA form responded to this in a way that the NCAA now probably regrets. Their response was they sent a cease and desist letter to California's legislature and it included warnings that if California passed this requirement where California member colleges had to allow their athletes to endorse products, the NCAA would no longer allow California schools to participate in postseason sporting events. This was supposed to scare the heck out of the California state legislators. And frankly, to some it did. Now, and I believe it was July 9th of 2019, uh, there was a hearing in the state of California about whether to support this bill. And Nancy Skinner was allowed three experts to talk on behalf of the bill. Uh, the first person who spoke on behalf of the bill, it, bill was Russell O'Kung, who was a first round draft pick in the NFL. Uh, he has a lot of personal business interests now. He talked about the value of allowing college athletes to endorse products. Uh, he talked about growing up in a low income community himself, about how being able to endorse products for money uh, would help people get used to working with money and thinking from a business perspective and why it's unfair that every other person that goes to school in California naturally has the right to endorse products for money, but the athletes don't. And if we think about this, in this world of Instagram celebrities, there are people all over the place at the University of Iowa that I'm sure endorse something for some sum of money. The thought of allowing everyone but the athletes to do it seemed bothersome, and he was the first speaker. The second speaker that day was Haley Hodson. Now, Haley was a, a volleyball player at Stanford University, and then she went on. At the time, she was a law student at UCLA. Uh, she is now a practicing lawyer in New York. Uh, the NCAA had tried to make the claim that allowing athletes to endorse products would have only helped the football players and not helped women's athletes. So Haley spoke about the opportunities that had been passed to her to endorse a, a sunglass brand that she had to turn down to comply with NCAA rules and really brought doubt to this argument that it wouldn't help a greater range of athletes. Now, the third speaker that day was me. And I was brought in as the antitrust expert to speak on behalf of the bill. Uh, the NCAA had threatened to ban California member colleges uh, if they allowed their athletes to endorse products for money. Uh, my job was in 180 seconds. You guys gave me 40 minutes plus 20 minutes of questioning. I had three minutes there. And I had to explain to the California legislator in three minutes or less why it is that the NCAA threat was not real. I explained that if 1,200 member colleges got together and they threatened to ban certain schools for giving commercial opportunity to their athletes, that would be a group boycott and restraint of trade in violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. I think I was successful because there were two Republican Congress people who were ready to vote against the bill, not because they didn't agree with it, but because their college ADs said, we don't want to get banned, and they voted for it unanimously, uh, they were persuaded, and rightfully so, that the NCAA's threat was just that. 
Now, to me, the story gets more interesting still, because California's bill had this four-year delay period to go into effect. And I am far from an expert on how state statutes pass, but as it went through, uh, someone with a loud mouth and a lot of opinions said, we don't think it's going to go through if it goes through right away. We need to give California an out. We need to give a delay. What do we do about athletes that are already there? So they put in this restraint that said, well, this doesn't go into effect for four years unless some other state passes a bill that allows college athletes the rights to endorse products first. Here's where things get interesting. I'm going to have a tangent, and I'm going to come back. The tangent is cartel theory. If anyone knows anything about cartel theory in economics, a cartel could hold together for a long period of time. But as soon as one entity breaks away from the cartel, the cartel could fall very quickly. Because it might be better for every entity if they all go along with the cartel. But if one breaks away, none of them wants to be a part of it. Now, we've seen that happen in terms of cartel theory uh, a few years back uh, with OPEC, where OPEC was this oil cartel that would not release more oil and kept price high. And as soon as Russia decided that they were going to break away and release more oil, all of them did that. Now, we probably would have seen a complete fall of OPEC, except, and I'm not going to get into foreign policy, a former president of, this of the United States thought it would be a good idea to sit down with OPEC and help them get back to colluding. Yeah, I think you know my views on that one. The NCAA is an economic cartel. And it was good enough for many if no, st if no school in any state was allowing athletes to endorse products for money. But the minute that California changed its law, huge sports fans in other states got very nervous. And the first state to get nervous was Florida. You see, Florida has some very good sports programs over the years. The University of Florida, Florida State, Miami. They like the fact that traditionally they're nice, they're nice weather and their beaches and other things that some people might like about Florida help them recruit top athletes. Their fear was many of these athletes will no longer choose Florida schools. They'll come to California. It's not only the parts of California have nice weather and beaches, but you could also go to California and endorse products and make money. So Chip Lamarca came along, who was a state senator in Florida, and he in essence said, I'll be darned if we lose these athletes. We need to pass a bill too. So without the years of foresight, but moving very quickly, the state of Florida became next to pass a bill that said we will not, we will require that all colleges, public and private in the state, allow their athletes to endorse products. And they did not have that four-year provision in it. They said that bill would go into effect on June 30th, 2021. I'm sorry, July 1st, 2021. So on July 1st, 2021, as of six months prior to that, Florida was going to allow their athletes to endorse products for money. And lo and behold, California's sunset provision would no longer apply because there's a second state, so they were going to do the same. As the Florida bill was percolating, many, many other state legislators wised up. Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Georgia, all these states have for long said, we don't want to allow our athletes to endorse products for money had this uh-oh moment. If we don't move quickly, we're going to lose potential recruits. Not even through direct pay, but if they could endorse products, why would they choose to come here and get the free education that pulls them out of classes 50% of the semester? And they could actually make money for generating money in other places. And as we approached July 1st of 2021, the NCAA collectively realized, hmm, we threatened to ban the California member schools. Probably can't do it, but we made the threat. But are we going to threaten to ban California schools and Florida schools and Pennsylvania schools? And Michigan? What are we going to do, ban two-thirds of our institutions? 
So on June 30th of 2021, the NCAA issued a press release. And again, classic NCAA. They said that they are going to make reforms and they're stepping back and they're no longer regulating the name, image, and likeness space and they will not come after any school or any athlete that makes money endorsing products. The NCAA calls this their reform. Well, you know, they changed their rule. Whether they were really the leaders of this reform or dragging behind their tail, I think we all know clearly which one it was. Now, the NCAA, not really knowing what to do, said we can't have pay for play, but didn't define that any further. The NCAA, not knowing what to do, said any individual college that doesn't want to allow athletes to endorse products, they could do that. The NCAA, not knowing what to do, said if conferences want to pass rules, let conferences pass rules. But I think this was the right move by the NCAA. It was just many years too late. And it wasn't done under their control. It was done by compulsion. But they stepped back June 30th, the day before these bills would have gone into effect. The day before they did go into effect, that leads to the name, image, and likeness era. So everything you guys are going to talk about in the seminar of different speakers, this is what really led to it. Now, I'll speak for five more minutes, and then I'll open it up to questions. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about what went right, what didn't go so right, from name, image, and likeness. Now, let's talk about the positives. First. College athletes are actually endorsing products and services and are making money and are gaining business skill. A lot of athletes have these opportunities. The ones that are most lucrative are disproportionately coming from star players on football teams. So. You do have players like C.J. Stroud of Ohio State University who, who signed a multi-million dollar or a series of deals that amounted to over a million dollars to endorse products. The NCAA claimed that this would not lead to opportunities for a large number of students, but that's not true. There have been a series of deals that have included entire teams, and they've all had a little bit of more spending money. Here's another really interesting and cool fact what the athletes are doing with the money. Now, no group is entirely one way or the other, but we have stories of college athletes that are buying homes for their parents who had never owned. There was a very well-known story about a college athlete who did something for his entire team. There was a story on YouTube, and it's kind of hard to watch this one without getting into tears. He was a college athlete. His older sister was not. He signed a name, image, and likeness deal. And the first thing he did with his money paid off every cent of tuition for his sister. There are families that are now able to go to college sporting events and big time games because the athletes are able to send money back. Apparently, there's money going back in many cases for rent, for housing, for shelter, for food, for athletes. Dispelling a lot of the myth of what certain NCAA individuals had claimed that the athletes would do if they earned money. Another myth was that there wouldn't be opportunities for female athletes, which has proven to be very much untrue. Uh, one case, the gymnasts are doing especially well. Uh, my understanding is the highest earner from a true name, image, and likeness deal at this point is a gymnast at Louisiana State University, Olivia Dunn. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times, which I'm neither going to agree with or disagree with, uh, that brings out certain concerns about how some of the female athletes who've earned the most money uh, have also been targeted based upon their appearances as opposed to just their pay. Um, but for whatever it's worth, there are a number of female athletes as well as male athletes who are making real sums of money endorsing products. This is life changers for a lot of people. Truly life changers. That's the positive. 
as far as the negative to date, this whole name, image, and likeness world has moved incredibly quickly over an 18-month period. And unfortunately, sports agent law in this country lags behind. A lot of that, and it's a different paper I've written, a different topic for a different day, is the NCAA's fault as well. That yeah. the Uniform, the Uniform Athlete Agent Act, Act, which was proposed by the Uniform Law Institute, is supposed to regulate sports agents to ensure that sports agents have the best interest of the athletes in mind. Um, but in the drafting committee, there was a former chancellor at the University of Nebraska who sat on that committee, uh, who at the same time had a very high rank within the NCAA. Uh, and despite what the bill was supposed to do, it became a bill that primarily served the interests of colleges and made agents disclose deals to colleges as opposed to put an affirmative obligation on the agent to advocate for their athletes, which means in a very short period of time, we have these athletes that once were being exploited terribly by the NCAA, and many would argue they still are because they're not compensated directly by member schools, now have a ton of people that are saying that they want to be their agents and they want to help them sign name, image, and likeness deals. Some of them are good and have good intentions. Some of them are bad and have bad intentions. Some of them have the best intentions, but things go awry. And there's very little regulation of this space. Some colleges want to regulate their space themselves, but what credibility do they have at this point? They fought against name, image, and likeness for all these years. They cried wolf. Do they have the credibility to advise athletes right now on what's good and what's not good for them? And then we have the emergence of the name, image, and likeness collectives, which I think is going to be a major topic for the next several years. The collectives are fascinating. The NCAA member schools maintain these rules that say that no college could directly compensate their athletes. Now, I am of the belief that this NCAA rule, much like many others, violates antitrust law. I am of the belief that if this rule gets challenged up to the US Supreme Court, it will be overturned and NCAA colleges will not collectively be able to stop other colleges from paying their athletes. NIL collectives mean all types of different things. In some cases, they are really group licensing arms that lead to a lot of name, image, and likeness deals being received by the athletes. At the exact opposite extreme, at some points they are booster clubs that are compensating athletes to come to a school as long as the NCAA has restraints to prevent the colleges from doing it directly and may or may not have anything for the athletes to endorse. At the end of the day, I don't believe the name, image, and likeness collectives would exist to serve any purpose if we struck down the NCAA rule that prevented colleges from directly compensating their athletes. But until we get to that point, the next series of questions we'll see are first, are these payments being made for college athletes use of their name, image, and likeness, or are they something else? And second, there's something else. Should we even care? Or are the college athletes entitled to something more than third-party compensation when they're providing the labor for a multi-billion dollar enterprise. I'm going to stop right here, and I'll take any questions people have. Thank you very much. Um, so I remember when these uh, laws from like California and Florida were starting to be debated, uh, many legislators threatened to pull funding from their public universities if athletes started taking NIL money. Uh, did that ever come to fruition in any state uh, since NIL has become uh, legal from the NCAA? Uh, I am not aware of any state pulling any money from any athlete or any school whatsoever 
uh, this was another one of these giant threats. Mm. Uh, there were several of them. There was, there was a threat that, that, that they were money. money. There was, there was the NCAA threat, threat that, that they, they would, would not be allowed to compete in full season. season. There, was there was the threat, threat that they were going to have large, large sums of athletes, athletes endorsing all types of advice. advice. None, None of them that ever came to date. These were just threats. Uh, so I was kind of concerned about how athletes can move so quickly without the institutions being, I don't know, compensated or somewhat for it. Like now there's, it's a freshman of a big year, I'd say, Iowa State last year, a big basketball player, went to Texas for a lot of money, uh, everyone assumes. So in other sports like football, you know, they would get trade value back and then get transfer feedback. Is there any mechanism like that you think needs to exist in this NIL field to kind of keep the institutions whole, like the smaller institutions, I guess? That's a great question. question. I'm assuming you're a law student, right? Yep. What do you want to do when you graduate? Practice. Pra practice, practice law. What's your dream firm to go to? Fagre. Let's say you go to Fagre, and you work there for a couple of years, and they, and train, they train you. you. And you decide, and you, decide you don't want to be a Fagre anymore. Maybe you want to come for some crazy reason. You want to come to New York and be at Scanox, where I began my career. Should you be allowed to do that? Yeah, because I would think that would be an at-will employment situation. Now, it's no different. In college sports. sports. I mean, I mean it's it's at that will, the schools will claim it's not even employment. I mean, Jennifer Abruzzo, the head of the, uh, the general counsel for the National Labor Relations Board, um, believes it is employment. That's going to be a question for the next few years. But at this point, you know, there is nothing. They're claiming, if you want to take the words of the colleges and the NCAA, they claim they're students. Now, if the claim is that you're a student, you should be able to move at any point in time. But even let's suppose you're not a student. Uh, currently, the FTC is looking to strengthen its rules that prevent non-competes uh, that's currently going through the process. Even without strengthening those rules, typically, as a matter of antitrust law, an industry-wide non-compete would be seen as a violation of antitrust law. Uh, so in essence, what these transfer rules are are really non-competes, uh, which very likely would be found to be illegal. Now, your next question is, why don't we have this? Why do we have the transfer fees that are paid in FIFA? Why don't we have the players freely moving um, in professional sports? And there's an easy answer to that as well. And this is true both under European Union law as well as under US antitrust law. Where the athletes unionize, there's something known as non-statutory labor exemption. The non-statutory labor exemption to antitrust law, and I'll somewhat oversimplify, says that if you unionize, labor law trumps antitrust law, and there can't be a violation of antitrust law within the system because it's agreed to it as a matter of labor law. So long answer back to your question. So the NCAA member schools decide that they are no go longer going to challenge the employee status of college athletes. And they will support or agree to some form of college athlete unionization. And they enter collective bargaining over the mandatory terms and conditions of bargaining, hours, wages, and working conditions with their athletes. They could agree to terms that would limit the movement of college athletes and limit transferring without it violating antitrust law. But the NCAA's new efforts to say we want to limit this very reasonably might violate antitrust law as it's currently written. I've written an article with Michael Carrier at Rutgers Law School on that and almost certainly will violate the rules if the FTC's new regs go into place. Hidden in the FTC's regs, a statement, there was a line that said that you, a non-compete clause is disallowed whether you're paid or not paid. So I think it's a really rough move. Uh, in a completely non-related tangent, I made it to Raymond's this morning, um, and I did buy a shirt that said, I am going into a transfer portal. Uh, I do think the transfer portal is legal and efforts to restrain it probably a violation of antitrust law. Sir? Sir? Um, so I say this to me, following Swarm and how I was handled the relationship between the collective and the university, but in your experience, what is that like at other universities? Do you see collectives becoming the ugly compromise that lingers, or, or I guess, how do you view that relationship here compared to other places, and is this sustainable? The one question. It seems as if, from what I've seen in the news, there's been greater criticism of the Iowa Athletic Department's relationship with Swarm with their NIL collective 
than we've seen in some other places, and perhaps greater efforts by the University of Iowa uh, to maintain independence from the collective in certain ways. Uh, let me answer you broadly, and then I'll come back and I'll talk about Iowa specifically. To me, the Nil Collective is an unfortunate, unnecessary, and should be obsolete. Now, I mean no disrespect to anyone who's running Nil Collectives. We shouldn't need them. We shouldn't need them because if you believe in capitalism and you believe in Adam Smith's view in wealth of nations, that capitalism works. If there is somebody that wants to sell a service and someone that wants to purchase a service outside of extreme examples, there should be a legal marketplace. And if we don't have a legal marketplace, an underground marketplace will emerge. And we could turn to all types of different examples to support this. You know, during a war on drugs, we didn't manage to get drugs out of this country. We had underground drug dealers who sold a substance to people who wanted to buy them. Until states began legalizing sports gambling, we did not have sports gambling in this country. We had illegal underground markets. In the former Soviet Union, as the USSR fell, when there were certain bans still in place on the sale of luxury goods, we didn't have no luxury goods that were sold in the former Soviet Union. We had underground markets. The NCAA could have any rule in the world that it wants to call its internal bylaws, whether it's legally enforceable or not. So they've decided that they want to have a rule called the principle of amateurism that says no college may pay their athletes. Now, if you read the Alston decision, we know that's never been the case. We know from the very beginning of college sports, athletes have been compensated under the table. Whether you want to take the SMU scandal from the 1980s or more recent scandals, there always has been underground payments from schools that want to recruit the best athletes to athletes to induce them to go. To. The entire Adidas scandal was payment of, to assistant coaches to try to induce athletes to go to places. And when you don't have the legal markets, the upfront markets, you get these black markets that are sometimes more disgusting than the worst real market. And I'll give Louisville as an example, where you couldn't pay the athletes in kind. So they had strippers and other types of people that were being introduced to the, the prospective athletes to try to get them to go there. Rick Pitino's Louisville. Now, now that the NCAA has said we are not going to regulate name, image, and likeness, we have these associations of boosters who would love to see the teams do well, who are very happy to transfer some of their own money to certain athletes to induce them to come to a school. We could drop the fiction. If we drop the fiction tomorrow, if the NCAA said we are dropping this principle of amateurism, any college that wants to pay its athletes could do so. Every college that doesn't want to pay its athletes doesn't have to. We're not going to have this collusion. What we'll see happen is the nil collective would disappear. It wouldn't serve any purpose other than to work with the university, hand in hand. There might be some colleges out there, like Harvard, that might still choose not to pay their athletes. They might feel we're Harvard and people are coming here for the education at Harvard and we don't have to do it. There will be many colleges that are very quickly will jump on board with paying their athletes. Alabama likes being number one. Alabama will certainly pay their athletes. Many, many schools like Iowa will have to have the difficult decision. They want to continue to be tops in football, want to continue bringing $100 million a year in revenue. Well, you need to entice some of the top schools, top athletes to come here. It could all be done above board. But until we get there. As long as the 1,200 NCAA member colleges continue to have restraints that say colleges can't pay their athletes, until the big 
decision from the NCAA becomes something more intelligent than we're going to run to Congress and try to get an antitrust exemption, until we start thinking about this sophisticatedly, until the leaders of college sports, the presidents of universities, speak with the same level of intelligence and common sense when running sports programs that they preach from in front of the room when they teach all of you, we're going to continue to have an absurd system. And as long as there's a demand for big time college sports to pay the athletes, supply of athletes, demand to pay them. And as long as the NCAA rules disallow it, you're going to find interesting ways to try to get the payments there. Now, do I think every NIL collective is the same? No, because I don't think every school is the same. On one end of the spectrum, certain schools, and I think University of Miami might be closer to this, seems to be almost, we can't do this. You guys, we support it. It'll make us good. It'll make us more money. On the other extreme, seems like the athletic director at Iowa, for whatever reason, is very risk averse and doesn't want to get too close to the swarm or the nil elect collective. I don't think one's right. I don't think one's wrong. I think there are two different ways of dealing with a broken system. I think the way of fixing the system is allowing colleges to pay their athletes directly. Then you don't need the collective. But until we get there, in this middle step, until we get antitrust decisions, hopefully, that allow colleges, if they choose, and only if they choose, to pay their athletes. We're going to have this really weird world with NIL collectives where the fans are going to want the collective to pay the athletes. And revenue maximizers are going to want the collective to pay the athletes. And the athletes are going to want it. And they'll find something that the athletes could endorse to check a box and keep the NCAA. But I don't think you can blame the collectives on either side. I don't think you can fully blame an athletic director for feeling comfortable or less comfortable with it. I think you need to blame the 1,200 presidents of the NCAA schools who continue to put this pl rule in place. Iowa votes with all the other schools, not just choosing itself not to pay the athletes, but not to let any other school do it either. And it's not going to make the markets go away. They'll just find an interesting way to do it. Let me come one and two. Right, right, right back. back. Um, if colleges can then pay like student athletes directly, what kind of impact do you think that will have on like smaller sports that don't make as much money? Um, I don't think most athletes in smaller sports would get paid. And if we think about the reality of college sports, I think I'm perfectly fine with it. You know, on one extreme, you have football. And we have football at the University of Iowa that brings in $100 million of revenue per year. The labor force, the people that play, the people that risk the injury, the people who are on TV every, there's a labor force behind them. Now, there are other programs that many schools have that are called sports, which are really providing opportunities for people that want to continue to pay competitively to continue to play competitive. Now, my favorite sport to pick on is fencing. One of my good friend's daughters is 12 years old. Um, she is now all of a sudden they're teaching her fencing. I think the goal is to try to get her into a better college with it. Here's why I pick on fencing. The equipment's very expensive. No fencing programs, to the best of my knowledge, bring in revenue. And for the most part, and I'm not going to ask here who grew up with fencing, but most public schools don't have fencing. Most private schools do. The more expensive the private school, the more that they do. So typically, and I'm stereotyping a little bit, I do have a friend who was first generation, came here from Cuba, was an excellent fencer at the University of Pennsylvania, exception to the rule. But you have these fencers and squash players and golfers who are already from places with means, who are generating no revenue, who are then given the opportunity to play a sport and have the expensive equipment provided for them, whereas you have athletes in other sports that are from lower income communities who are bringing huge sums of the revenue who don't get it. So I don't 
think you're going to lose all of these other sports at other schools. Uh, I do think that maybe they might be done a little bit more cost effectively in terms of travel. Uh, I don't think every school is going to have every sport. Um, and I don't think the athletes that play are really going to be bothered about not being paid by the schools directly. I think they would continue in certain cases to be able to get endorsement deals. And if you continue to do something you really enjoy that's not bringing revenue, it's not costing you anything, uh, I still think there's benefit there. Did I answer you fully? Do we know anything about how the NIL revenue is affecting the relationships amongst the team members? Because you're going to have most of the team that's not getting these deals. You know, that's... It's interesting. interesting. I mean, what you're seeing, the you know, football's interesting, but in a lot of cases there's deals for whole groups of players and a whole lot of players. Basketball, because team numbers are so small, the team deals cover quite a bit. Uh, the place where I've seen the biggest disparity, to be frank, is women's gymnastics, uh, where you have the few who are Olivia Dunn's who are making multiple millions of dollars a year uh, and the majority who are not. But I don't think for any college athlete this is going to be the first time where there are haves and have-nots. Uh, for those of us that went to college, there were haves and had nots all the time. I went to the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, there was a bar on campus called the Palladium. 10% uh, of the school drank at the Palladium on a regular basis. I don't know how many hours of work I would have to do to buy a single drink at the Palladium. Always have haves and have nots. On any team, you have some haves who have more because they were born into wealth. Uh, you have some haves that might have money for other reasons. If you look at the disparity between the coaches and the players, you have the haves and have-nots. It's an unfortunate part of society. Um, but I have not seen any examples of team dynamics breaking down uh, because certain athletes have made more. Uh, and you certainly should hope that that wouldn't happen because whether it becomes means becoming a professional athlete or becoming a lawyer or taking any single other job that is not on a unionized pay scale, There'll always be haves and have-nots in society, for better or worse. I think I'm getting the T, which means either technical foul or time's up. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, one final thing before I close. The last speech I gave before I was here was at the University of Oklahoma, a very similar topic. Uh, and I got back, and I had a fluke sickness, and I was in the hospital for a few weeks after I gave the talk. And the first thing I said when I went in there, when I was listening to a talk, was a nurse asked me what I was listening to. And I said, this was me back before I got sick. I just hope I could do this again. So I'd thank you not only for coming today, but I would thank you. This is my first time to get to give this talk again. And it's been my pleasure. So thank you for having me here at the University of Iowa.